Hi, welcome back to Bob Speculations. I'm Daniel. I'm Scott. This week we talk about Critical Role Campaign 2, Episode 79, Through the Trees. Yes. Uh, right off the top, I want to praise something that Matt uh, does, but I think did an, an especially good job in this episode. Okay. And that is his foley. Um, it's something that I do mm -hmm. a lot when I GM, uh, because personally I find it easier and faster to say, to, to make the sound rather than try to describe it. Mm. Um, and I was a fan of Michael Winslow. Yeah. Uh, when I was growing up, so I did my best to imitate him. Um, so that's really the only place that, that pays off for me anymore. Yes. When, get to... <laughs> when you're running a game, you yep. need to sound effects. Yep. Uh, so, yeah. Um, but one of the things that they joked about in episode 78 with someone asked the question, you know, how many horses have we? Left behind, yeah. And crit roll stats answered that for talks, and it was thirteen or something like that. Something I don't remember offhand. Uh, but they tie up their horses there at yes. the Jor house. Yeah, at the Jor house. After trying to pawn them on, pawn them off on Essek. Yeah. Um. And. So what do you think Essek needs? Because, so I don't know what the whisper was, but I get the distinct feeling that if he didn't need these chips, expecting to cash them in, he wouldn't be doing these favors for them. If he didn't sense a need okay. to gain the leverage. Those are two separate questions, and I don't think... So I think the whisper was actually Matt telling Caleb, telling Liam, that Essek is attracted to Caleb. Okay. Um, and I think when he touched Essek's arm, that was him uh, cashing in on that understanding mm. and using it as a point of manipulation. Okay. Um, the evidence outside of that, I mean, it's there, but it's scant. Yeah. Um, the fact that he did teach him Dunamancy so quickly. Um, I mean, yeah, that was a big deal that they gave the dodecahedron and he already admitted that he had mm -hmm. used the dodecahedron and looked into it. Yeah. But... Yeah, I think that that might be why one of the reasons why Essek did that um, is that he is attracted to Caleb and wants to do everything he can to ensure Caleb's loyalty to the dynasty so that they can have some hope of being together. So Essek is Williams Gilmore this campaign. I guess. I mean... That the NPC attracted to him, that he's going to flirt with to get advantages, and yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, that's so. That's that's my theory. Um, See, my, my mind didn't go there at all. I I, I felt like. And now, now that you say that, I can kind of see that in Liam's reaction in actions afterwards, Caleb's actions afterwards. But uh, my brain took it, and I took it as he's got some he, – because he's mentioned he's going to need their help soon, yeah. more than once. And he, he plays it close to the vest, but he seems to be worried about something, in my opinion. 
I mean, yes, there's the war and everything, but there seems to be something that he's focused on. And I feel like he's like, I've got to get as much leverage as I can to make sure they do this thing. Okay, so... I think what Essek wants them to do is going to deal with the politics of the Dens. Okay. I don't think... Uh, I don't think it's going to be empire. Like it's not going to be dynasty shattering, or it's not going to be key to the dynasty. I think Essek is going to be that in to the politics of the dynasty that Matt has alluded to, mm-hmm. uh, but hasn't really shown that heavily yet. And I think the key, the key. Uh, clue for me in this regard was when Matt reiterated Thalus. Okay. Uh, And I'm trying to think if it was it was after the second teleport. Okay. Um, Yeah. And so, yeah, I think the dens are going to be important. And I think that's also another clue for this. That is, that's where Dyron seems to be trying to focus her investigation. Okay. Um, and I think that's mostly because she, if she's going to find a way in or a point to exploit, it's going to be uh, in the inter-conflict between the dens. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, um, by the way, I was wrong. Uh, I, I didn't really throw it out as this is a thing. I threw it out as a this is potentially a thing. And that was that we saw him le- levitating all the time. And I mentioned the ninth level warlock invocation. Can't be that. Because he can cast teleport twice, which means he has at least a 15th level wizard. Use one seventh level, upcast one eighth level. Yeah. Which means he can't be a ninth level warlock. Uh, well, he could have. Uh, he could have a magic item. Yeah. That Boots of flying yeah. or a ring or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. I. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, and he said it, it tapped him. Yeah. On that lo- on so, the only way to do it twice and have it completely tap you. Is to be fifteenth level, and you have one in one. Yeah. Um, which probably is also where uh, I almost said Umagorn, but the the wizard in Nicopolis. Um, um, Usa. Usa. Yeah, that's probably it's where. Usa and Yeza. Uh, that's probably where his power level is too. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking. Um, I'm thinking he's. In, yeah, I figured he was in the 15 to 20 range. Yeah. Um. But they get him to teleport them, and then yeah. they go. Yeah, this isn't exactly where we need to be. <laughs> yeah, and that's where. Yeah, Bo Bo and Ford being the rude ones, and then Caleb. Soothing things over. And see, I don't know if Ford was rude. And. uh, So here's the thing. They were the dickish customers. Let me talk to the manager. They completely were. Yes, but also. This is what we asked for, but this is what we really wanted. So you need to give us this now. Yes. Okay, that's that's fair. (laughs) But like my, my view of it is. If they had mishapped and gone way off course, Essek would have had to cast the spell again anyway. So, but I, I mean, yes, from his perspective, he did everything right and put them exactly where they wanted to be. Yes. From his perspective. Um, and part of me wonders if that first, because really that first part of the episode really did foreshadow everything that came after. Yeah, with the do all the 
talking about this, this here and this here, and then somebody finally deciding on something and telling Matt, I'm doing this. Yeah. Um, Cause that's really what that came down to in that scene. The, the miscommunication happened because the mighty nine didn't decide, okay, you are going to be the one to tell Essek where we're going. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's um, unfortunate, but because I think actually it was Sam who finally made the call. Yeah, yeah, and so Sam basically got what he wanted, and I was trying to decide on Thursday and on my rewatch uh -huh. where. Like, whether or not Matt wanted them to catch them or not. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know that, like, because I was thinking while they were doing that persuasion check, you know, and I was like, if it were me, because he seems pretty upset, it would be one person rolling with advantage, but they've got to get a 30. And I think his was lower. Or... That my my brand, I would, I would admit it, one at 30 or two at 20 plus. And that's what they got was two people at 20 plus. Might have been 25, you know, and then 20 for one person. I don't know if I would have made it that high. Um, that's where my brain went to with how I was reading the situation and what I would have done. So, on the persuasion check, and on spell use in general, uh, because characters don't have to do anything to get the spells back, uh, essentially the cost of each spell level can be calculated out, and I did, based on a uh, moderate lifestyle. Okay. Uh, Needless to say, even the high-level spells have less than a gold in cost for that wizard to cast. Mm. From the standpoint of, like, it's more costly in opportunity cost for that wizard or cleric or bard. Right. Because they won't get to cast a different spell later in the day. Yeah. Um, and for Essek... These level spells are spells that he can't recover on or can't recover. Right. Um, so, from that perspective, they are a little more costly. Um, but in terms of his day, uh, it's not a big deal, I, yeah. I don't think. Um, I think it's just a mild inconvenience and an annoyance. And maybe maybe it might be higher if Essek has a thing where he detests being used. Yeah. And if he feels being used, then that sets him off. Then I could see, okay, yeah, maybe maybe you set the DC a little higher. But, yeah. Um, it was impressive that they both got 26. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, we now have both clerics taking spells from uh, Acquisitions Incorporated because Jester took Insight Greed, mm. uh, which she needed a component for. Mm -hmm. And... Bo was going to give her a string of pearls, um, but it ended up being Caleb gave her a diamond, mm -hmm. and which made me laugh. You know, because I'm on lots that. of Caleb shipping. Yeah, um, even though Ford later made a comment really quietly, so that Laura didn't hear. <laughs> 
I'm pretty sure that's why he said it. Yeah. That quietly. <laughs> but Sam's sitting right there, so Sam heard it. And then he tapped her on the shoulder and he said, he said you have an attractive hand. Uh, so, yeah, I... But the funny thing for me was when Caleb gave her a dime. Uh, he's the first one to do that. So, yeah. Uh, interesting thing that happened in the episode that I wanted to touch on because it was such a point of contention in the episode. Okay. Was Ford casting Summon Greater Demon mm -hmm. and calling the Balgoran. Mm -hmm. And he did something with the Balgora that we haven't seen him do before, which was use its innate spell casting. To the point that I was confused, because it had been a while since I read the Balgora right. entry. I was like, can it do that? I was like, and there was some speculation that they reskinned it. Uh, well, he, at least color wise, visual wise, not necessarily mechanics. Because he said instead of the normal one you see, you see more of a, a fey style, you know, yeah, with plants and stuff. Which I don't understand why. To make it more wild, mother. Yeah, but like to me, it it is more flavorful and impactful if that is not affected. Yeah, because it is the darkness dwelling within him that he is calling on. But the wild mother told him, I can't do anything about that. Yeah. Um, and I think it lessens the impact of him for swearing that spell. Yeah. If it, if when he casts it, it's just reflavored as it's the wild mother's demon. Yeah. Which if that is, in fact, the case, it brings up a whole host of cosmological issues. Of course, if, it does explain why she has a tree there in the heart of the betrayer gods. Well, that was explained to us as basically being a pole. <laughs> but I'm just reaching. Yeah, that's yeah. Oh, fair enough. Um, but yeah, that's yeah, and that should the, the thing that stuck out to me was the discussion about the component cost. Yes, and there's been some discussion on the internet over whether it was the right call or the wrong call. I believe it was the right call. You obviously don't. <laughs> I okay. From my perspective, it's not a matter of right and wrong. Okay. I mean, raw. So Matt has, with Travis, Matt has never been right, particularly stringent with components. And I, I think it's him lapsing into his campaign oneself of not being stringent with those things, well, especially and with Ford the newer is not, players. Well, and yeah, Travis is not. But I think he's, this is him actively trying to say, hey, we need to follow these things, you yeah. know? Um, and I think some of that might be just because of the some of the shit that Matt gets on Twitter. Right. So he mentions, when they mention the component pouch, Ford's like, yeah, that's what I've got. But then he talks about the weapon being an arcane focus. Which it is not. Which it is not unless you take the pr improved packed weapon uh, invocation, which he has not done because he has five invocations. And the five that he has are Mask of Many Faces. Agonizing Blast to add charisma to the... Uh, he has Thirsting Blade, which lets him attack twice with the Pact Weapon. Yeah. He has Gift of the Depths, which he did not switch out, because there were some people saying he may have switched that one out, because when they were in the clearing with all the ghosts, he used it when he stuck his head yeah. underwater. Yeah. And then Relentless Hex is the last one he picked up, which allows him to teleport to someone he's either hexed or hit with his hex blade yeah. curse or something like that. Which is out of Xanathar's, I think, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, so those are the five he has, and then he's got the boon from Ukatoa, sixth one, yeah. bonus one. Uh, but those are the ones he has, so he does not have an improved packed weapon. So the sword, I think he maybe thought, remembered that because he was probably looking at that. Yeah. 
Um, but it doesn't, he doesn't get any, that would be the only benefit that invocation would give him. The other invocations, you know, the other benefits of the invocation are if it's not a magic weapon with the bonus already, it's a plus one to attack and damage. Yeah. And you can create a longbow, shortbow, yeah. crossbow, um, which he doesn't need because he's tying it to an actual weapon, not creating a new one. Right. Because um, you can't create the weapon into anything if it's if you've tied it to a magic weapon. Right. Um, so I think he skipped that because of that, because of the limited. So yeah. his weapon is not... Because he got a magic weapon weapons. early on. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think part of this is the way that both Travis and Matt have narrated his Eldritch Blast mm -hmm. as coming from the sword. Yeah. Um, that I think in in Travis's mind, that made it seem more like an arcane focus. Yeah. So. Yes, he should have the components. But Matt hasn't gotten on Laura about scrying. That's true. Which requires a thousand gold piece focus. Now uh, we talked about that when she narrated her laying out those crystals. It's like, are those really a thousand yep. gold piece worth thing? Yeah. Is that an, is that enough? Um so you know, and honestly I, I think we're just gonna see him getting stricter with it as this campaign goes on and as each campaign, you know. When this one comes yeah. to a close, if they start campaign three, I think he'll be a little bit stricter with it. Yeah. Um, and uh, the fact that the clerics can basically use their holy symbol for anything, except for if it has a gold, gold component right. a cost. And I, 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 th I think if you notice, he's more strict about it with Talison and Liam than with Lauren and Travis, and even not to a degree, Sam. Yeah. And that's because they're the experienced players. They're the ones that have played before Critical Role. Yeah. The other three have not played before the home game. Right. Well, and Liam and Laura even complimented Liam on, that she loves that he does it. Right. But he narrates his use of the components. Yeah. Um, and so does Sam. Right. When the spell requires it. Right. But, I mean, I, I think it's him kind of being, you know, he's stricter on them because he's kind of like, come on, guys, step it up, be the example, help yeah. me get these guys okay. to that point. That's fair. And that's why he's stricter with them. Um, but Matt said in the episode that it requires a vial of blood which the spell consumes. That is incorrect. And this comes back to what we talked about when they were on the ship. Mm -hmm. And he summoned the Belgora to fight Avantika and all that. Yes. Matt hasn't been doing the charisma saves every turn. It's true. Every turn... The demon you summon gets a save to break your control over. Right. The spell says the blood is only consumed if you form a circle with it, which the demon cannot cross. So it is designed so that you you pour it out on the ground and you protect yourself mm -hmm. as the summoner. And this yeah. thing just goes off and does whatever. Yeah. Um, to be fair, Fair though, it's kind of like one of those middle cases. Well, the, according to the spell, that's true. And Jeremy Crawford did say, "Hey," and he did say, "When you're making the circle, so he's speaking to that point. This it is consumed, right? Um, you do, but you do need to basically kill someone every day. Yes, because that you plan on casting it. Then the next, you know, but, the next day it's more than twenty four hours old." Yes. However, if you have a if you have an arcane focus, you don't need the blood at all, because the provided blood does you're not, not make in the circle. Yeah. Provided you're not making the circle, because the blood it does not have a gold component right. cost. But again, Travis, by his invocation choices and the admittance that he has the component pouch instead of the arcane focus, does not have a arcane fo focus and thus needed the vial of blood. Right. Um. So yeah, and, and that's just, that, if, if he had chosen to summon it again, it shouldn't have cost him an extra vial. Um, so yeah, and that and that's that's what, all I wanted to say on that subject. Um, and and my my comment was more on the arcane 
focus versus components and you yeah. know yeah i wanted to yeah i wanted to take a deconstruction of the whole yeah. that whole thing because marisha's like at the end of the episode she's like we we need to dig into this yeah um so and there was even a tweet about them being they're super long oh was there yeah and from marisha that even danny was surprised how long they stuck around for that chat uh -huh. and it was longer than normal okay so maybe we will see the correct yeah use of the spell and travis and and, and, and I, I think part of it I don't was know. the argument was probably not argument per se but discussion over how strict are we going to be with component usage going forward mm. yeah well and matt said he's wanted to be more strict this campaign yeah. um and maybe they had a powwow where it's like, okay, let's look through your guys' spell list. Yeah, Let, let's do this. Okay. Every spell, we'll, what, we'll, what's the component? The ones that are not consumable but have a cost, we'll say you've had because you've been, had, been letting you cast the spell. These ones you'll need to re-get, yeah. you know, and they may have gone through that. Yeah. Um, um, so that everyone's on the same page moving forward. Right. Uh, which I did love Liam's comment. He's like, I make a point of buying weird shit all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah do you expect us to buy weird shit? Um, from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yes. So, the bark that bites. The wraith root tree. Yes. Uh, the root beer tree. I want to say obviously, but we didn't get to see all of its abilities. But in my mind, that was basically a, a trant, trant with an undead skin on it. Yeah. Uh, and some abilities to become incorporeal. Yeah. Uh, plus whatever uh, MacGuffin mechanics Matt had built in to get the heart. Yeah. Uh, which the heart did not kill the tree. Um, so I'm wondering how, how far afield is that tree going to go to try to get that heart back? Yeah. Uh, because part of me really wants them to make their way back to that tree and have a chit chat with it and recruit it mm -hmm. so that they can have a tree ant helping them out. Uh, well, an undead tree. Yeah. Unique, unique take on tree stripe, but okay. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, damn. But what excites me most about that whole sequence is we have more of the poisoned land. Yes. Which is something we've been talking about from the beginning. Yeah. Um, and I think in the beginning, I made the point that this may be uh, Mort to Arthur, sort of a tale mm -hmm. and a reflection of uh, King Dwindle and the Bright Queen and their uh, failures there. Yeah. They are the reason why the land is sick. Um, but I think, smartly, probably, Matt has chosen to make these things remnants of the calamity. And they are demonic in nature. Okay. I still think the quest of the Mighty Nine is going to be much like the Grail quest. That if they complete it, they will heal the land. Mm -hmm. I don't. I think that's still correct. Okay. Um, but tying it to the rulers it, uh, is obviously not correct anymore. Yeah. Um, well, you know, um, it could be tied to uh, the Bright Queen still. There's a part of me that thinks the Den politics is going to be replacing the bright queen who's been in charge for how many you know yeah and 
you know, the corrupted leader, the absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's why she's so like, and that has spoken to her paranoia on multiple occasions. Yeah. So it could be her previous lives have all ended by assassination. Yeah. And maybe Essek is, you know, hey, it maybe it's time to get a new head of state. If anyone's going to be an upstart, it's going to be him because he's the new to the dens, quick in power, on his first life. I don't know. Something, something about the way that Matt has played Essek leads me to believe that he is uh, a genuine believer in the Bright Queen. Hmm. I think he's a genuine believer in uh, the Luxon and the Dynasty. That does not. That is not mutually inclusive to the Bright Queen, especially if she's been corrupted, and especially if he uh, agrees with Bo's. Uh, arguments. Yeah. Um, or even Caleb's that, hey, you know, maybe just take out the cancerous parts and leave the good people rather than just slaughtering. <sighs> maybe there's cancerous parts in both. Uh, well, I mean, certainly because they have the two, the group working together across the border, right. bringing these demons. That's for sure. Um, but, I mean, that's a potential dark place for his favor to go. Yeah. For him to ask these outsiders to kill the Bright Queen. Well, um, they've obviously got power and they've obviously got a in. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's that. But. Okay. That's an interesting take. Um, so, the whole. What drove the debate through the whole episode, really, mm -hmm. is what do we need to do and what resources do we have to make it happen? Yeah. And most of them were tapped, well, most of the spellcasters were tapped out. And you had Bo and Not saying, we'll go. You guys can rest. Yeah. We'll go do this. Not to worry. Yeah. Um, which I think was the best plan. Um, I think had they done that, they probably could have gotten the thing, the the head off his belt. You think? Yeah. Or would Marisha and Sam be coming back with new characters? So this, this is a group that fought them pretty much to a standstill as a group against just two of them, and they were tapped then too. They were pretty tapped going into that fight, yeah. too. No, okay, so the thing is, is, though, they don't have to fight them to win, to get what they want. Not has invisibility. She's really good at stealth. She almost got that damn thing. It's true. In the middle of all that chaos. If they could have snuck up on them without everyone's hoo ha around, I think they could have gotten it. And the thing is, is so. So, not makes the grab and Bo picks him up and busts ass, picks her up and busts ass out of there. Yep. Heisman Trophy style. Yep. And she uses her stunning strike and her sentinel abilities to control the battlefield enough that not can make her escape. And then she turns tail and runs. And she's faster than a laughing hand. She will outrun that. Yeah. In an open forest, without a druid or ranger, the two best equipped to get in and get out and get what they want were Bo and Not. And yeah. I think if they would have done that with Blessing of the Trickster for Bo, 
to give her advantage in her stealth check, uh, I think that would have worked. Uh, so, also, I think they jumped the gun on the flight. Um, if I'm going to nitpick. Okay. Uh, I think it should have been on the ground until you see the campfire, then you take flight and get ahead of them. Because okay. now you've caught up closer to them. Yeah. And now you have, you're have you using the flight when it benefits you the most. Whereas yeah. instead of using it to catch up, and now you're falling basically on top of them, uh, catch up and then fly and get ahead of them. Um, so, I mean, and that's a timing issue. And yeah, that's... That's something that I think falls back to each person at the table having a different idea and their imperfect information as to uh, how far behind we are. Yeah. Because all they got was three to six hours. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I, I just want to point out, I, I love that moment with Caduceus. I find it's best to ask the locals, wait, do you, are you talking to plants or animals or yeah yeah I mean this, okay this is a guy who talks to plants animals peoples and via commune gods yeah this guy talks to everybody he is the most connected person in the night yes and we've been speculating that he may take levels of druid yes I became convinced this episode that is never going to happen I'm pretty sure too. And along with that scene, he's got the fly, and the frog eats the fly. And for all, do we follow the frog? No, no. He's no help. And my brain went to Willow. <laughs> follow the bird. The bird's going home. Forget the bird. Follow the river. <laughs> yes. And it was just like this beautiful moment that just made me appreciate Caduceus. <laughs> Not that I didn't like Caduceus already, but... Uh, yeah, that's true. Just gave me a whole new level of appreciation. And see, I... When they were doing the whole... Can you can you fly? I can fly. I had the whole Peter Pan. It's the one, one of the few times where a song has entered my head that it didn't enter the cast. You can fly, you can fly, you can fly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The... But it comes back to uh, several episodes ago, we talked about how once you reach higher and higher levels, a lot of the higher level spell slots, spells, are more making adventuring convenient. Yeah. Uh, sp speed of travel, you don't have to worry about provisions anymore, you don't have, you don't have to worry about finding a place to stay, Yeah. all these things that when you're low level, are stress inducing, mm -hmm. and you're scraping. When you get higher level, you have spells for that. And, and, and unless you take magic initiate, Goodberry. <laughs> yes. Uh, which is a good magic initiate to take for a life flurry. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, for anyone, but yeah, for a life flurry, I mean, the heals, but yeah. Um. So, one of the things I wanted to talk about leading up to uh, the fight is the moment where Travis cinched MVP for me. Okay. And that was his casting of Charm Monster. Yeah, that was... Um, some interesting ha things happened there. And I don't know if it was Matt grabbing at straws to try to not give him a charmed laughing hand in the moment, or if this was something that Matt had thought about, or in the moment, this... So something was revealed in that scene. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a big deal. Okay. And that's principally that the laughing hand was charmed by Oba. 
because Matt, he's, he's, what kind of save is it? Okay, rolls it. Uh, fail. Up. If you're fighting him, he has advantage. Rolls. Fails again. Shit. Okay. And then he goes, you know what? Actually, make a charisma check. And he rolled behind the screen mm -hmm. as well. And I think he applied Oban's charisma modifier to that check. Okay. And Ford beat him. And he says, you're rolling lucky today. Yeah. And, and they I, did for the first half. Yeah. Things went to shit after that. <laughs> you know, the dice know. Yeah. They do. They really do. Like, so much of this episode, especially near the tail end, I don't know if you could have written it better. Right. With all the dice rolls, not just failing to get the bag. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just everything like, about it. it. Th this episode really felt like how, in a movie or a TV show, the the protagonists, the heroes of the story, suffer this huge setback that makes them come back together as a team and move forward even. This whole episode felt like that scene in a movie. Yes and no. For me, it was more like... a. So, if you deconstruct the... If you lay Star Wars on top of this... Okay. Uh, the fight with the Laughing Hand losing Yasha is the end of Empire Strikes Back. Okay. Uh, the team's been scattered. Han's in Carbonite. Luke's lost a hand. Everything's gone to shit. And they sort of regroup. And this is... the I'm trying to think. This is more like the moment when Lando and the Rebels are approaching the Death Star and they're being jammed. Hmm. Okay. Because it's a trap. Right. But that's not exactly the right thing either because they sort of get themselves out of that. But this was more like the an episode in a TV show where you get to see what the bad guys have been doing. Yeah. Um, the cutscenes, right? Work and and more than that, that your heroes suffer a genuine setback. Yeah. Um, but not in a way that cripples them, because they weren't really crippled by this loss. Like, so there were a couple of fail states in this episode where this task they that they yeah. gave themselves was doomed to failure, and the first one was teleporting to the north into that forest. Yeah. If they hadn't have caught that and Essek hadn't teleported them further south, done. Yep. They get to the tree, they get the heart, and they're out. Uh, so that was point of failure one that they managed to avoid. Point of failure two was they get in a fight that they don't want to be in, which almost happened, but they avoided it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third point of failure is what we saw yep. in the confrontation uh, that they don't get to the tree before him and yeah get, yeah so and one thing I wanted to talk about is Oban's crew um, he said in the uh, he said at one point our party is our, our group is almost complete uh, our found family our found family was the specific line yes um is Matt building an anti-nine? So, hear, hear me out on this, okay? Hear me out on this. Okay. Oban, and I'm kind of split on who he's the anti of. My initial thought was Caleb. Caleb or Ford. Okay, my thought was Caleb or Chester. Caleb because... They're both book smart. Those are both spellcasters. Uh, Jester, we know Oblon is serving Gratz. They're both serving someone who is powerful but not a deity and kind of bought into that whole, you know, servitude, you know, 
um, this person. I'm, I'm working for this. Well, see, I equate the Angel of Irons with Ukatoa. Okay. That's so why I say we'll, four we'll, we'll, get to, the we'll, we'll get to the Angel of Irons. Okay. That, that's someone else for me. Okay. Uh, you've got Ford, the Laughing Hand. The Laughing Hand is a hero that's turned villainous from the backstory. That was corrupted. Okay. Ford, arguably, because he's a warlock, is a villain that's being restored to heroism. Or was a hero that was corrupted and now is finding his way back. So they, they are kind of... Okay. Um, Angel of Irons and not. Both abandoning mothers. The, the Angel of Irons collecting abandoned children, not abandoning her child, being forced to abandon her child. Yeah, see, I, don't, I wouldn't equate that. Um, um, I think if you want to put that, put, equate not to somebody, it's. Uh, Starts with B. Vincent, the blonde. Okay. The infiltration, the, mm -hmm. the, the rogue, okay. the sneaker. And that could be. And then uh, Yasha. Now, it's her own. Yasha could be her own, or she could be Bose. Two frontline fighters, speed versus strength. So I did love that classic matchup of yeah. Barbarian versus Monk. Yeah. In that moment, I, I really wish that they had gone a little longer. And I also liked the after insertion of the sexual tension between Bo yeah. and Yasha. Because I think in the moment when she used her reaction, her, her readied action, i.e. her reaction, to dash to get in there, and she went straight for Yasha. Mm -hmm. Uh was interesting, and I think in in the in those fractions of seconds between choosing what she was doing and where she was going, Marisha settled on that's why. Okay. Um, and also why she apologized to everyone at the table because mm -hmm. I yeah although I didn't get anyone at the table going what are you doing right in that moment. No, I think. But I think she, in her mind, she made the wrong call for yeah. the wrong reason and was apologizing. Yeah. Even though they didn't, you know. Right. Um, which, this new one they're going after, Ju Jublian? The Hearthead? Uh, Juriel. Juriel. I guess would have to be Cad. Are you saying that because it's the second character? No, I'm say, saying that because he's the only one left. <laughs> um, but it could be that. Um, it could be the similarity of a hero that, you know, Cad was forced to watch over a portion of a hero. This is a hero that was portioned, you know, or a villain that was portioned out. I, I don't know. The only connection that they have is they're the last two left. Yeah, I mean, you, it's an interesting thought exercise for sure, but I'm not sure that I would say that they're the anti-nine, um, just because the nine aren't really, they're no Vox Machina. Like, Vox Machina were heroes. Right. They wanted to be heroes, they were pleased to be heroes, they embraced the role, Yeah. and they did everything they could to make the world better. The Mighty Nine are not that. No. Um... I think each of them has a tie in some way to each of the bad guys. I think that's true. Okay. Um, known or unknown. Right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't think he's necessarily making a an anti-nine. I think he is assembling the evil team so that they will have ones to go after. Okay. Um, cause I sense that as we're in the second tier, we're, you know, we're in, we're getting into the higher tiers now. Yes. So the climax is going to build. And right now, Oban is assembling his crew and they're going to get all together 
And once they are together, that will reveal the big thing. Right. If they haven't figured it out already, which is... They are to the big bad of this campaign what the Chroma Conclave was to back then. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Um, but their end goal is going to have to be those crystals. And now we have been in two locations that they need to plant those crystals. Mm -hmm. um, but Caduceus's journey has not revealed that yet. Yeah. Um, so he doesn't know that that's what they have to do. He just knows the next place I have to go is that oasis or yeah, what have yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. That's going to be yeah, that will be how they either prevent the Tarrasque from waking or put the Tarrasque back. Yeah. Uh, to, re, uh, to renew the chains, basically. Um, but so another mechanics thing that I noticed, mm -hmm. and I kind of, it, it, my ears pricked up in the episode on Thursday, and then on my rewatch, I confirmed it. When Matt was giving Bo damage from Yasha, he didn't give her the rage die huh. in damage. Just oh, the, the shroud. The zealot? Yeah. He just gave her the slashing damage from Skin Gorger, the necrotic damage from the shroud, and didn't give her... The radiant damage. Do you give her the rage damage though? Uh, yeah, probably. Okay. He didn't break it all down, but the rage damage would have been folded into the slashing damage from Skin right. Gorger. Um, he just didn't do the extra die of radiant damage. Um, it's a minor thing. It was one hit. It, it didn't make or break the combat. Doesn't really matter other than. Uh, well, I wanted to point out how much. Crap, Matt's doing behind the screen. The the reason I ask if he added the rage damage is because if he didn't, that could be him signaling that she is fighting the control to the best of her ability. I had not considered not that. Raging. Well, she did rage. Okay, that was her first turn. So if she didn't, her first turn was popping her wings. Action, bonus action. Rage. Right. But if she dropped it. Well, not or dropping not. it, but you might have a point. Yeah. That either Yasha or the Stormlord mm -hmm. preventing that damage from happening. Yeah. Signaling the fight. Yeah. And protecting her out, her former ally. Yeah. That's true. Okay, I'll head count of that. Okay. <laughs> Done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but. Did Jester help Oban escape? Yes, absolutely, 100%. Katri was only going after the bad guys. She should not have targeted the tree. Yes, 100%. Jester inadvertently helped Oban escape. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was my conclusion as well. Um, whether or not that was a genuine aid or not, is debatable because I don't know if Oban actually triggered would have triggered an attack of opportunity but the tree had a turn in there that it would have been beating Oban yeah. to bits that it didn't get yeah um, so yeah for sure uh, but yeah uh, one of, I want to touch on Marisha and Liam were talking about how quote, horny they were for combat, end quote. Yes. Uh, and how they both were just like, Bo was so frustrated with her dice rolls and with the the culmination of the evening and how it went that she just wanted to hit somebody and when Yasha triggered that sentinel attack, she wanted to take it. She hit, speed drops to zero, and now she gets pummeled. Yep. Um... And, so, you know, I'm going to say this, like, 
you know that I prefer story over the combat dungeon yeah. crawl. I get that way too. If we go too long without any kind of conflict, I'm like, I kind of want one. And inevitably, when you do, shit goes wrong for you. <laughs> because you're not used to it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this was a prime example of that. And it happens every time. Every time, like, and I'm and don't get me wrong, I'm loving the story. I'm loving the story. I wouldn't change it. You know, I could really use a good cop. Oh fuck, I just screwed myself. <laughs> every time. Yep. And Liam. I'm looking forward to the confrontation between Jester and Caleb. Okay. Yeah, on the tenth, because there has to be a confrontation between them, because Laura Jester was super. I don't even know if pissed is the right word. Upset, certainly, that he abandoned the teleportation circle. Yeah. To come in and do the thing. Uh, and arguably. The only thing, like, had he done it sooner and been in range to cast Counterspell, he could have defended his action. Mm -hmm. But in the moment, the way he did it, uh, I mean, so how, what do you think his rationale was in that moment? I think his rationale was... I want to hit something, because it's been... I think that was Liam's rationale. I think Caleb's rationale was if I don't get over there and help, there's not going to be anyone to run through the teleportation circle. Or there's not, people are going to, we're not going to get everyone through. Yeah, maybe that is. And he's also incorrect in saying that they have never had a combat that went 10 rounds. This is true. Um, um, I think the other part is like. And in campaign one, they had. Uh, Tiberius casting a teleportation circle mm -hmm. for the whole of a combat. Yeah. Um, um, the, I think the other Although thing, I think he allowed him to cast cantrips and, while he was doing it. Yeah. Uh, the other part of it is that um, he uh, he was the one that tried to come up with a plan to get Yasha while they were there. Yeah. Which comes back to what we were saying. And that, Jester was one of the most vocal, no, we can't do that. Yes, she had some pragmatic art, but she was the one that was like, you know, and I, I think Jester's afraid. She saw Ford go to Yasha, and Yasha not willing to leave with him when they lost her. Well, I think she's afraid of Oban's control over Yasha, for sure. I, 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 no, I think she's afraid that Yasha isn't being controlled. No, she said, she straight up said, we know now that she's being controlled. Same, Although, same way she says, yeah, I'm sure he's my dad. Technically, that line was after the scry, and Liam's pitch to save Yasha was before the scry. Yeah. So when she, at that time you may be correct, but she was afraid that Yasha was not being yeah. controlled. Um, and same reason why I think she's relieved they didn't go to the gentleman. She has in her mind this, but deep down she thinks it's she thinks Yasha's being controlled. She thinks Yasha's still her friend. She wants to believe that, but deep down she's afraid that no, Yasha's not being controlled. She's not her friend anymore, and she doesn't want. To be faced with that disappointment. Well, yes, well, gentleman is my father. I'm sure of it. Oh yeah, he thinks so too. He doesn't really think so. I don't want to face that disappointment. Yeah. Um, we have uh, just a little few seconds left. Yeah. Um, not did nothing wrong again. Love that moment. Yep. Uh, so I think the next episode we're going to get an answer to your question of what is uh, Yeza 1. Yes, or Essek. Essek. What is Essek 1? Um, this is definitely a match revenge for Vex and Vax. Usa, <laughs> Yeza, Essek. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only you're getting us 
the viewers, Matt, not your players. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, we will see you guys next week. Or, yeah. yeah, next week, I guess. Um, we may or, do another uh, UA discussion or yeah, something. Yeah, there is another UA. Um, but uh, we'll be back to watching Critical Role on the 10th and the one shot on Thursday. I guess. <laughs>